Phone's been running hot this morning with the news that Rocket and Williams are parting company. Sad to hear that. I don't really know what the problem is, uh, whether Williams have left Rocket or vice versa. Presumably, it's a money issue. What a surprise. Um, but moving on from that, there's a certain irony, is there not, that this is happening. And indeed, we have to think about the 12,000 or so people that Renault are laying off at the moment. Uh, it's happening in the backdrop of the latest cost-cutting rules put out by the FIA, which the teams in general have applauded. So what we're saying is, despite all that, it's still not possible for a Williams to walk into an investment bank in Wall Street and say, isn't Formula One looking incredibly economical now? Back us and let's make this happen. It may happen in the future, of course, but as I say, there is a certain irony that this is all happening simultaneously. Uh, as an ex-Willy guy, obviously feeling not good about any of this, not that I have anything I can do about it, but uh, Williams, I think we all love Williams as a team. I think we, I'm referring to Formula One fans in general, but obviously a lot of Frank Williams friends and family as well. It's, um, you know, it's a sad time if Williams are in this much trouble. What I would say is that they've got a great pair of drivers right now, George Russell, Nicholas Latifi, We've got some very good engineers there, so hopefully if they can keep it together, they will get some results relatively quickly, once and if the 2020 season gets back into life. As for Nicholas Latifi, just a thought about him, he is good. He's got a lot of road dust on him now from some very good years in Formula 2. He's learned a lot. I think he'll get on really well with George in terms of information and learning from George, obviously. He's not, um, not incapable of doing that, certainly. And interestingly, his... Father is a really, really cool guy, nice guy. He's an investor in McLaren, but who knows? He might in the future potentially be interested in doing something at Williams. And if that happened, I think that would be a very, very good thing. He's a, he's a great guy. Anyway, um, moving on from that to the regulations in general, anything that is out there tangibly reducing costs has to be applauded, I think, in Formula One terms. And I think most of the concepts that are now going to be adopted are good ones. Interesting handicap system they're bringing in now with the uh, penalty for being successful, hurting you in terms of how much wind tunnel testing you can do. There is still quite a lot of testing that is done in a tunnel, despite what you might hear about the uh, rise and rise of CFD in Formula One these days. The best teams have a perfect match, match between, obviously, CFD, error testing and track correlation, the lesser teams struggle with those different components. But if they're allowed more wind tunnel testing than some of the more successful teams, it will make a difference. Not a massive difference, I don't think, but it will make a difference. That's an interesting one. And just as a reminder, the tunnels testing these days is at 60% maximum. And you would think that there would still be some logic in trying to reduce the costs of building the 60% models for those tunnels and that maybe a full-scale tunnel might be an economic, more economic way to go and that you just put the full-size car in there without having to worry about modelling. But of course the answer is that these days it's so relatively easy to photo print a model from the real full-size car that the costs are almost negligible. So it'll be interesting now I think to see what effect that does have over the balance of power over the next two or three years. In general, if everything that Formula One wants to happen, the FIA wants to happen, does happen in terms of the cost cutting, that would be a good thing. And it will have some sort of effect too, probably on the growth and growth or not of the ultra expensive, absurd motorhomes they have in the Formula One paddocks these days. I don't think anyone will get rid of their current motorhome, but probably now with the budget cap and having to operate within that cap, they won't be spending more money on a new motorhome. So that's a good thing, if nothing else. But we won't see any reductions, I don't think, which is a bad thing. We'll probably see a more homogenous schedule as well. I'd like to think that we won't be just dashing all over the world from beginning of the end of the year in different directions, that there'll be more logic to the way the championship's put together, carbon footprint-wise. And I really hope, as I suggested as long ago as Melbourne now, that we start looking at the concept of having more than one race at one circuit over a space of time, maybe two or three or four week period. That would make much more sense as well. There's also a lot of talk in the new regulations about the standardized parts on the cars, which are all there to help reduce costs, presumably will help reliability as well. 
And that's a good thing, although at that moment I have to say I think an opportunity has been missed again at this time when we can do some blue sky thinking in the lockdown. I think we should have taken the big leap and gone to the rule, gone back to the rule of allowing teams to run customer cars. If we're going to have all these standardized parts, I just don't understand why the governing body don't think it's a great idea for the teams at the back of the grid, if they want, to run last year's Mercedes or last year's Red Bulls or last year's Ferraris. I think it'd be great for the fans. I think it would be great for Formula One. And I know it'll never happen, not because the FIA don't have the ability to set that rule, but because the teams are still living inside the blockade that Bernie Eccleston set up for them around 1980-81, when having finally won the war and realized that they now had control of Formula One and all its aspects, they said, right, how are we going to make sure that nobody comes in and takes this away from us again? And they came up with the draconian rule of every team having to design and build its own cars, of having to run in every Grand Prix and having to run two cars in every Grand Prix in exactly the same colours as well. And we still have those rules. They're there to stop new teams coming into Formula One or to make it really, really difficult and to ensure that if a new player is out there, they buy an existing team and therefore the incumbent owners make a lot of money. That's why those rules are there and that's why none of the existing teams will ever want to make it easier for a Prema or a Dams or an ART or a Hitech or a Carlin to buy two McLarens or two Ferraris and come into Formula One. As sad as that is, that's the reason. As I say, we have this lockdown now. This is a moment when perhaps we could have thought, isn't it time really to stop the compromise with these standardized parts and open it up to the possibility of customer cars? And when I say customer cars, I think we should also include a Dallara in there as well, if that's how you want to go racing. And let's face it, Haas are basically doing that anyway. So what is the problem? I just don't get it. Anyway, that's my one comment. Everything else I think is very positive. I hope it works. And hopefully the cost cutting will be sufficiently impressive for some investors, some new people to come in and say, wow, we want to get into Formula One. Let's buy Williams or Renault. Talk to you soon.